do it. Just let me see. I want to go outside and play. I have to see. Time to go down the slide. Jackie, a 20 year old nursing student from Red Deer College, has been experiencing some hallucinations, delusions, disruption of thought, inappropriate social and emotional behavior, mostly triggered by stressful situations. Some of the risk factors of schizophrenia include family genetics, but it can also occur without family history of schizophrenia. Any kind of brain injuries. Um, disruption during prenatal development. Prenatal infection or flu. And also malnutrition. And any birth complications. Another focus is the thalamus, which is, plays a role as a relay station within the cerebral cortex. And the hippocampus, which is responsible for long-term memory. In a schizophrenic patient, it has been noted that there is an enlargement of the lateral and third ventricles, a reduction in the frontal lobe, and diminished neural content in both the thalamus and the hippocampus. In terms of the neurotransmitter, there is an increased density of dopamine receptors, a decreased activity of serotonin along with glutamate because of its dysfunctional receptors. Also, there's abnormal abnormalities of the levels of and and homeostasis can occur in the second trimester of pregnancy where fetal development is working on brain cells. The brain cells have to form and then migrate to the part of the body where the brain is going to be formed. If the neurons do not migrate and connect properly, for instance, if this is the start and the end and the start and the end, they would have to connect this way. If they connect this way, there is a disruption in the neural pathway which affects thoughts speaking, emotions, and memory. So in regards to proteins in schizophrenia, um, they play an important role in the transmission of neurotransmitters. So in homeostasis, Jackie was referring to the start and finish, and by that she meant the start, which would be the post, or sorry, the presynaptic end of a neuron, and the finish, which would be the postsynaptic end of another neuron. So... Communication between the neurons occurs with an action potential, which allows fluid-filled sacs, also known as vesicles, containing neurotransmitters to move towards the membrane of the presynaptic end. So from there, the fluid-filled sacs or vesicles are able to let the neurotransmitters come out into the presynaptic space. Those neurotransmitters bond to receptor sites, which are proteins, on the postsynaptic end, and then can either release an action potential to carry on to another neuron or not. And any neurotransmitters that are left in the pre and postsynaptic space, which is also known as the synapse, are either degraded by an enzyme or taken back in through transporter channels back into the presynaptic knob to be recycled and reused when an action potential goes through the presynaptic knob again. I just don't get this cell membrane thing. How could you not understand this? So the vesicles that have the neurotransmitters inside of them go to the cell membrane of the presynaptic knob. Then from there, the presynaptic cell membrane becomes permeable, goes across the presynaptic space, binds to the receptor sites within the cell membrane of the postsynaptic knob, and just follows through like that. Hey, how you been? Oh, hey, better, much better. Good, did you go see the doctor? Yeah, he uh, prescribed me some antipsychotics and uh, I'm thinking about doing some naturopathic methods like acupuncture and stuff too. Oh cool, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, thanks. Nice. So in summary, um, homeostasis is affected in 
the fetal development, when the neurons are growing and they're supposed to connect, if they don't connect properly, then there's an increase in dopamine receptors and abnormal amounts of neuroreceptors. In regards to proteins, proteins play an important role in neurotransmission. So they're the neurotransmitter receptor sites are made of proteins and also the transporter channels are also made of proteins within the cell membrane.